Hi everyone. I guess let me know if you can hear me, if anything sounds weird or if the sound and picture don't match since I consistently have problems with that. Um, I hope you're all doing well today, having a good day. Um, so today what I want to do is uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was showing the, um, when I was doing the swatches for the Reapercon colors, and here I'll change views and just put those on the screen for now. Uh, so I was doing these swatches and talking about the metallic colors and someone in the chat, I think it might have been Trash Rama, but I'm not 100% sure, asked what can you do with those kinds of paints other than paint metal objects? And my answer was you, I've painted like silk and satin type cloth before, but it's actually been quite a long time since I've done that and I don't have the the miniature it was just a few and I don't have any of the miniatures anymore I did them as gifts so I thought maybe it'd be fun to sit down and do that so I did not uh, do like a test one in advance or whatever since part of the theme of my show is kind of being experimental and being willing to take risks and and have failure but because that's something we can learn from so I'm just going to do it on stream uh, and we'll find out how it turns out so uh, I'm going to try and focus on those colors. I, I'm going to do a couple of different miniatures because I figure I'll be able to swap between them while they're drying. So hopefully that won't be confusing, but uh, rather than just having boring time while I do drying. Um, so if you're interested, if you, if you didn't see the previous streams and you're interested in how to uh, swatch paints, and there are different ways than doing it than this and why you might want to swatch your paints for your own uh, benefit while you're painting, there's a couple of streams up on the, up about that, which you can, I think they're probably still on Twitch, but if they're not, they're on Reaper's YouTube channel. Um, and let's see, what else was I? Oh, so I'm, I'm kind of in convention mode. So this, this show is, is taking a break from that, but I've been kind of in convention mode and um, talking about stuff, kind of getting ready for ReaperCon and, but other conventions too, because they're coming back on the calendar. So last week, the show was about, um, here, I'll just put the miniatures we're going to paint here. The uh, kinds of way, different ways to transport your miniatures to the convention. Because whether you're playing a game or you're ending a contest, the, the big challenge is getting them to the con. Um, and I've now got a blog entry up about that. If you go to that website, I can't, can't make my finger work that way. Here, we'll do it with the thumb. If you go to that web, well, anyway, the thing up at the top of the screen, if you go there, uh, and go to the blog section. The latest post is a summary of different ways to safely secure and transport your miniatures. And then at the end, there's a list of companies that sell commercial options that I've linked to. So you can check that out if you are coming to ReaperCon or another event and you need a way to move your miniatures around. Um, and then there's some other convention related stuff. I'm gonna do like kind of a master post that links to other things. Um, my cat is in here wreaking havoc if you hear strange noises. He's the one that doesn't come on camera as much because he doesn't like to get picked up. Um, so I don't know what he thinks he's doing. But if I suddenly panic and run away from the screen, that is the problem. So uh, I have often heard that it's better to put metallics over a dark base coat. And I don't always do that. When, if, if you've used the Learn to Paint kits, I had you painting just on the plain uh, white surface of the bones or gray, whatever it is. Uh, and I'll often do the same thing when I'm painting metallics myself. Now, I think one thing is that the paint is a little thicker. Um, so if you have to do a lot of coats, hi, Otter Mama 3. If you have to do a lot of coats with them, you probably can end up kind of caking up fine detail if you have filigree or something like that. Uh, I went ahead and did this because I think it will take fewer coats but I'm thinking that another stream at some point in the future, why don't we test the theory the way we, we like to test things sometimes. So why don't I have different, you know, base coat, some stuff in black, white, gray, different colors for colored metallics. Uh, and we'll go ahead and test whether it makes any difference or if once you put enough coats on, the solid surface just looks the same regardless of what the underlying coat is. So he's kind of a, I, I probably won't get to this guy, but I might try and do a little on him just to like talk about detail miniatures a little more. But these were the two I was gonna focus on a little more. So I'm gonna use the, let's see, 
So the, the uh, oh, I have to zoom back out for this. In the swag box, there's this black pearl and I thought the burnished platinum would make a nice highlight for that. So I'm gonna try those on this wizard's cloak and try and make it kind of like a magic cloak, but not, you know, he's, he's a, a wizard who gets stuff done. So I don't want it to be too, you know, city fancy type. I want him to still look a little adventure. -y. And then for uh, Action Jackson, I'm gonna try the Forge Glow. And I had to, since there's not a pale metallic in the set that goes with that, I picked some other stuff up. But I pretty much grabbed all of my colored metallics, including um, some that were from cons and stuff like that. So I have a bunch of colored metallics over here that I can demonstrate, if nothing else. So I'm just gonna start by doing base coats on these guys, or you know, putting the metallic part over the figures and then get on with the painting. Oh, but one, before I get there, one important tip for metallics. So I have this separate jar that says metals on it. And I also, I use a sponge to um, wipe my brush off. And I have a sponge with an M that I use to sharpie on the dry sponge on. It, if you're doing quick and dirty painting where you're painting for tonight's game and, or it's a speed paint or something like that, you don't have to go to that extent. But if you're working on something as a gift or a display miniature or something like that, you may want to have, you know, two water receptacles and then, you know, two different paper towels or whatever. Um, one for the metallic paints and one for the matte paints because if, if you're painting a lot and your water starts swirling with those little metal flakes, that will get in, you know, you'll mix up a wash with your matte paint, it'll get in that and you'll get little sparkles where in areas that are supposed to look matte on your figure. So how much you care about that is up to you, but I just thought I would pass that along as a suggestion for those who would care about that. All right, so as usual, and particularly with metallics because they have that metal flake in, so the paint, the, the metal parts of the paint are heavier than the, the liquid part and other components in the paint. So you definitely wanna shake these really well. So I shook these on my Vortex mixer before I started. Um, that's the highlight actually. I feel like this is is so dark that I don't know how well doing the shading and stuff is gonna start show up on screen. So I'm kind of I'm gonna try doing a half and half mix of these for like the foundation layer and see what that looks like. Now one thing that I've noticed about metallics is I find that they dry really fast or they start to goop up really fast. even if they're on a wet palette, they're not necessarily drying out but they're getting goopy. So I tend to, I'll, I'll use a little bit and then if it starts feeling like it's goopy, like this is more than I would normally put out for a metallic, but that's a big surface too. Uh, and if I feel like it's getting goopy, I will put out new paint and not just keep using that old paint. And I'll try to add water to it to refresh it or anything. I just wanna be done with that paint and use paint that looks that, that feels right, that, that I know is the correct consistency that's not gonna be adding a bunch of texture to my miniature. So you can see that, um, maybe I should grab just a regular paint. This one's kind of dark, but hopefully it'll work. I'm just gonna put a little bit of regular paint here and we can see a consistency difference. Although I think the, this is newer paint than this, but I think my Imperial Purple's in good shape. So this is kind of when I run the brush through the, and I know there's some reflection from the lights. I don't want to see it leave. If you think of it as a boat and you think there's a wake behind a boat, I want that to fill in pretty much immediately. And that's what I consider a good consistency for base coat. This is very slightly thicker than I might prefer. I'd probably use it anyway, but um, I don't think I need to overwater paint that I mean to use in an opaque passion. So, fashion. So if I'm wet blending, if I'm doing base coats, anything else where I want the coverage of the paint to be as strong as possible, watering it down a bunch is just making more work for me. So I just want it to be fluid enough that I'm not filling in all the nice sculpted detail or adding texture to the miniature, but it doesn't need to be any more fluid than that. And this metallic actually is pretty similar, but metallics are going to be a little thicker because they do have actual little flakes in them. And that's why I was saying they might, um, the, the value of doing a coat or two in 
a regular matte color is that you're, you're not going to build up that thickness as much. So this should cover pretty well because I did that. I'll go ahead and put some just on his hat. Oh, well, actually, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good coverage metallic anyway. So I'm impressed. So when I'm doing base coats, um, and I wasn't great about it. I guess I started at the top and went down. But I kind of like to start in one area and then work my way over. So up here on the shoulder, this has already started to dry. It's harder to tell with metallic paint because generally you're going by the sheen. Um, but if I touch that now, I might end up pulling up the paint and making a, a blotchy or peblier surface. Like it might even actually add texture, not just make that part so the coverage isn't right. So it might still show even when I did a second coat. As long as paint is still wet, like this is all still wet, so I'm going over it, that's fine. But once it's started to dry at all, and depending on your climate, I live in the land of humidity, so that's not happening super fast for me. Um, but if you live in Arizona or someplace like that, I don't want to, I, I actually want to keep the inside of the cloak matte. So I'm not going to do the inside. But this fold is really from the exterior. So hopefully that made sense what I was saying about um, the base coats. But now this is going to be wet for a minute, so that's why I picked a second miniature. So I hope it's not going to be confusing that I'm going to be switching between the two guys. So actually, before I forget, and I will mention this later for new people that come, this is Kalanin Dark Mantle. He comes in both bones and metal. So in bones, he's 77635, and in metal, he's 3847. And then this is Horace Action Jackson. He also comes in bones or metal. In bones, he's 80023, and in metal, he's 50033. So I want to use the super cool looking forge glow on him. Well, I like the, the afterburn. Now I'm tempted to use the afterburn. I think I'm gonna use afterburn. So this was from, um, well, no, I said I'd use the new stuff for you guys, but the afterburn's so pretty. I think I'm gonna have to do the afterburn. And here's another cat now. Hi, other cat. <laughs> they, it's like they know when you're doing stuff. So I made his um, initial matte coat of paint a little bit darker than I did on the wizard. Like I knew the 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 like purpley gray that was going on the wizard. I knew that was a fairly dark color. Um, but I thought I would just see what happens when we do that. And possibly I should have gone a little lighter. This is clearly not as opaque a color as that purple. And that's, um, I know that that's frustrating for people when you have to do multiple coats, but that's kind of the nature of pigments. That's not um, something that a paint mixer has done wrong. You'll tend to find that the same Colors in every brand have similar problems. When they don't, they're probably not as bright. So if you have a red that covers in just a few coats, it's probably not as vivid and powerful a red as your one that doesn't cover in very many coats. Um, and I, I paint um, with oil paint and watercolor and, and some artist acrylics, and the same thing happens. Like you can, they, they write the pigments that they use on the, the tubes. And you will see the same thing, um, you know, so if it's like there's a magenta color that's PR122 and it has pretty much the same level of transparency in an oil paint, in an acrylic paint, in this brand, in that brand. It's not that somebody's ripping you off or whatever. Some pigments have smaller, I think it's micron sizes or something. So white and black both have large, larger particle sizes. These are all still things that are smaller than the human eye can see, um, but it affects the opacity level for coverage. So this guy is clearly going to need uh, multiple coats of this color to get his disco satin shirt working. I did think about trying to look up some pictures for you guys, but since I haven't figured out... Um, 
how to put them on the screen and I just show you my iPad and then I would have to try to find ones that are um, copyright free use. So if you just want to do a Google search, I, in fact, I did a Google search on orange satin shirt and I got a few examples. So if, if you have your phone or whatever, you can um, just do that and see an example of the kind of thing I'm going to be trying to go for. Gray Mouser, I'm not sure I understand your question. You missed the update from on. What was it? If you're asking about a Kickstarter update, I don't have any information about that. So I don't have anything I can share. I don't know if someone in the chat, if there was, uh, I don't even know if they were streaming fulfillment today, actually. Okay, so it looks like whatever this question is, you guys are working out in the chat. If, uh, if I misunderstood and there is a question for me, just let me know. And I will do my best to answer it. I've actually always kind of wanted to paint this guy because I think he's super fun and I've just never gotten around to it. So now maybe I have an excuse to do it. We'll see if I follow through and finish him up. Now, normally I would not start with the shirt. I am going to make my life a little exciting trying to paint his chest and his face because they're right adjacent to the cloth. So that that is actually one of the most frequent questions I get from people who, who are starting out. Um, not that it's, it's not a question that you don't ask yourself some at other points, but it's what order to paint in. And that's a good rule of thumb is to paint uh, from the inside out is one way to look at it. So I would paint this little area if, if I was doing, if I was painting this as a full figure and approaching it in my normal way, I would paint this area and probably the face first because I'm more likely to get, you know, now that that I, if I paint the shirt first, I'm more likely to get paint from painting the skin on the shirt than vice versa. Uh, another way to think about it is paint in the order you get dressed. So you start with your skin, then you put on clothes, then you put on accessories like belts and boots, and if you were a fantasy character, armor plates and stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, work on kind of the most exterior items. I usually leave the hair for last because it's not uncommon that you end up doing something like this when you're painting and you end up rubbing off your paint or even if you if it's a metal miniature and you primed it you might rub off some of the primer and I'd want to uh, repaint the primer on to make sure that the hair is going to stick and then things like weapons especially sharp things like swords that figures are often holding something in one of their hands away from their body and I tend to leave those to the end as well. So that needs to dry a little, I think, but let's check on the coat on him. So if you look closely, let's zoom in just a little. Let's see. I'm not sure if you can tell because of the shininess that it's not, hold on, hold on just a minute. Sorry, my cat's being super weird in the background. Um, But I'm not sure if you can tell, oops, let's see. Let me get this behind it so it stops focusing on the palette. If you can see that you can just see some of the white showing through. So although that's, that's a pretty good opacity for um, a metallic paint, you can't see that as much on the one. So if you got here a little later, I had um, pre-painted the the cloak in that dark purpley color and then painted one coat of the metallic over. I can see a few spots where I missed though so I'm going to do one more coat just to make sure, I don't know if you can see it there at the hem, there's a little section that's not shining. So there is a little bit of a challenge in painting metallics because a lot of what you tell about um, whether the paint's still wet and and stuff like that is based on whether there's a sheen or not. And there's always a sheen on metallics. It does look different wet than dry, but it just adds a little bit to the complexity. And I find, I think that's why I don't like painting with um, satin or glossy paints for kind of normal painting. 
purposes is because it's harder for me to tell whether, say, I've, I've made the highlights right because maybe I'm seeing the effect of light bouncing off of the paint instead of seeing did I apply paint that was light enough. So I tend to prefer painting with um, matte paints, which most miniature paints are, but if you've tried to buy uh, artist paints, or I'm not even sure if craft paints tend to be more, you know, more of the craft paints tend to be matte as well, or if they are often glossy. But acrylic paint by nature, uh, the acrylic polymer is glossy, so they have to add something to acrylic paint to make it matte. And that is one reason why you should shake your paint, just one of many, because that made it, matting agent can be a little heavier and sink to the bottom. So I did just do the thing I told you not to do. I was trying to tell her about it. Okay, so once that dries, it should be good to go for the next stage. But our disco friend is definitely going to need at least one more coat and possibly two. And I didn't do, um, so just to, to show what it would look like over white, because maybe this is one that should have been painted over white. And I think it, it would, it's still going to need two coats, but it would have uh, worked better over a lighter color, I think. Oh, I suppose I probably should have started with that. So these are all bones. Um, I dipped them in isopropyl alcohol, 91% isopropyl alcohol. Uh, that's all I've done. There's no primer on here. Um, and I don't paint my bones with primer. I might do something like this where I put a coat of paint on before, but I do use just paint for that. Um, Usually when I'm putting a coat of paint, it's to make one of these white ones gray so that I, I think I've got my camera set so that you can see the details, but some of these white ones can sometimes flare under the lights. So I like to paint them gray so they're easier to see, or if I need to take photographs of them. I didn't think about that. I probably should have painted them gray because now if I try to take a photograph later, it will not be very fun. So I'm really not, because it's a metallic, I'm really not 100% sure if it's dry. So that's a test you can do sometimes is you go in a deeper crevice and you put your brush there and see, see if there's a little paint oh, and it's doing that thing again. I pulled a little paint off that crevice. Let's see if I can do that again. So with a matte paint, you shouldn't have to do this. You should be able to see that it's still shiny in a crevice like that. But since the metallic paint is shiny, I know he needs another color. So maybe I'll just do a little bit on the um, Novacorp Sar Sergeant, who also comes in both bones and metal. So he's 80010 in bones and 50005 in metal. And I was going to put the, one of the other Kickstarter colors, the Race Steel, on some parts of him. Now, he's, I'm not doing it on the cloth. I'm doing it on the metal plates on the theory that, um, you know, if you have futuristic space armor, it could be all kinds of different shiny materials. If I were painting the sky for will, I would spend some time thinking about which parts are supposed to be like solid armor and which parts are supposed to be cloth because I don't paint enough futuristic miniatures to be super up on the conventions for that. Because obviously if it's all hard, then he's not going to be able to move. And this, I think, I did just blue liner as the initial coat. I know it probably looks black. I'm not worrying too much about whether I get some um, metallic paint in the crevice between. So there's, there's these different armor plates. Hopefully you can see it in the, on the camera. I don't know if it'd be better even to try to keep my palette. I try to do it so that you can see what I'm doing on the palette at the same time, but the camera seems to be a bit boogery today. Um, 
So I'm not stressing too much about whether I'm getting paint in between the um, plates because I can come back and address that later. Just, you know, get my blue liner black out, back out and put a line in between those plates. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to paint carefully enough to leave those plates separated. That is a good way to build brush control. And, um, you know, if you can do it and you're painting for speed, that is probably a quicker way to paint it than the way I do, which is I tend to be sloppy and then just fix it later. Um, and I know that sounds crazy because I do all this detail stuff, but I kind of, somehow my system has ended up being that I worry about the parts I have to worry about. Like, I don't care that I'm, if I get paint over there, I haven't painted that part yet. I don't care. Um, but I, I do admire people who can start with like a black base coat and you leave that and that's your lining instead of doing your lining at some other stage. That is an excellent way to build brush control. Well, doing lining is a good way to build brush control too, I imagine. I believe Anne used to uh, suggest people do that. And when uh, John Bono did some work for Reaper, she had him do a lot of lining on like the mechs or something to help him build his brush control, which I'm sure was super tedious. So I won't worry about the back of him. And apparently I forgot to even do the blue liner on that foot, so. But that's an example of one of the other Kickstarter paints. But let's see if uh, Horace is ready for more orange. So the orange I'm using is um, Afterburn, which was one of the colors from RVE. The other colors, the other metals that I've been showing are um, in the uh, swag boxes that you, if you want some of these colors that I've showed you, and you get miniatures and swag and all kinds of cool things too, uh, you can pre-order those boxes right now on the Reaper.com website. So I, if, I'm not sure, I think I mentioned this fairly early so other people might have come in. I often don't like, I find that metallics on the palette, whether it's a dry palette or a wet palette, start to gum up or this looks like it's gotten watery. So I will often just put out a small amount and then dispense new as I need it. And I don't find that I have to do that with matte paints. Metallics also um, dry up in the bottle quicker. So I do paint maintenance every few years and I had been bad about it. I had done it on my, like, um, I have a little stash of paints that have gone out of production. So I have backups. So I'd done it on my backups, but I hadn't gotten around to doing it on my main paints. Uh, and I went, I have all my, I have all the other, you know, I've got the emerald green and the standard Reaper metallics as well as the new stuff. And I went through all of them and they had, they were clogging up a little more than I've been going through some of my standard paints too. Um, but they've been clogging up a little more, I find, than the matte paints. And I found that I used, I had like the second edition, well, I had the first edition pro paints, but... I'd gotten rid of them, and then when they came out with the second set, I got those, and then I'd kind of left them aside in a box for a long time, and when I came back to them, it was the metallics that, that were lost. The other paints, almost all of them, I could address, but I had left them just long enough that the metallics had kicked up beyond redemption. Uh, Vigo Peeps asked, was Afterburn in the RV kit or one of the fast palettes? Um, I mean, it was in one of the RV swag boxes, but I thought those colors were now available as singles on the website. And Avrilina of Darnassa says, I have Afterburn in the Cyber Metal Fast Palette. That sounds right. Um, I did do swatches for those and I forgot to pull that out. But I just, I love this color. So I was really, I was like, I really want to paint his disco shirt. That color because this is I, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the horror of 70s fashion I am old enough to remember it um, and there was lots of spandex and lemme and all kinds of stuff so this seemed 100% suitable for his outfit and then I'd probably just do jeans for his pants because or maybe I'd go look up old uh, like Sears catalogs and stuff you can you can see some things. There. 
Okay, it's not going to help the focus. It does seem very finicky today. Probably the shiny metallics are throwing it off. I don't know. So because this is a little bit more of a transparent color, I will need to do a third coat, but I can proceed to the next step on the wizard. And Trouble says polyester. Yes, many, many things were made of polyester and other flammable materials. In a wide array of fantastic colors and some very not fantastic colors. My house was built in 68, I think, and we still have a couple of pieces of Harvest Gold stuff. We have a Harvest Gold sink and a Harvest Gold uh, fan over our stove. But over the years, we have managed to finally get rid of all of the mini toilets and sinks and other, other things, but those two. One day, one day I will live the dream and there will be nothing Harvest Gold in my house. Alright, I'm going to leave that there for now. I am liking that color. That's very nice. I think it's very disco as well. Honor Mama says, my mom made my dad a ton of leisure suits in the 70s and it still haunts her. Wow, she actually made them. That is pretty impressive. Okay, so I do need to come back to him, but let's work on the next step with the wizard. And I am going to try and get my second rinse cup because I can see how many little metal flakes are floating around in there. So this is, if you've ever taken uh, Shaded Metallics with uh, Michael Proctor, um, this is a very similar um, premise. I'm gonna use matte paints for the shadows on the uh, cloak, and then I'm gonna use metallic paints on the highlights. So the shimmer should be concentrated where the light is gonna go, and then the shadows are gonna look darker because we're dulling down the sheen as well as the um, color. So we're making a darker color and we're, oops, I did weird things with my lamp. And we're dulling down the sheen. So I'm gonna use this kind of palette, uh, let me zoom out, to mix. They're not quite gonna be washes. In fact, maybe I can just do them on the, I can probably just do them on the regular palette. Oops, hard to move. But I don't know if I'm tempting the camera to have terrible focus still. Okay, so what colors had I picked out? So I picked out Kraken ink, which I think is from last Weepercon, but it's thematic with the pirate stuff still. And it's, uh, so it looks pretty close to black if you just paint out the flat color, but if you add a little water, it's got a purpley tinge, and I thought it would kind of work with that. It's a little more of a blue purple, and there's a little more red in this, but it's shadows, shadows being cooler generally works. Uh, cooler colors recede from the eye. Uh, well, cooler colors appear to recede from the eye and the warmer colors appear to move towards the eye. So in theory, these probably look a little closer. They jump out your attention a little more than these cooler colors that are around them. So I'm going to thin down this paint some, not as much as a wash. I'll do a goodly amount of it because we might have to do multiple coats. Actually, was I going to do a lighter purple first? Nope. I'm going to go straight to the Kraken Gig. If I have to go darker, I'll probably just use um, Blue Liner. That's one reason I like Blue Liner for shadows so much is because it, um, it's got that little bit of blue in it, so it's cooler and it recedes. So I'm going to add one drop of water, but if I want to thin it more than that, I will probably add Brush on Sealer, which is essentially the acrylic paint part of paint without the pigment added. So it's like clear paint. So if you don't like when paint gets too watery, you can use this instead, if, if that helps you control your paint. So I mixed up this one with the water. I could mix another pool with just the brush on sealer so you could see the difference. That was probably way too much paint. Normally I would put this back in the bottle if I were just painting in my own time, but I don't want to make you guys watch me do that. 
if you're interested in how I do it, I just pop this off and then use the brush to put the paint back in the neck of the ball. And I don't know, so I'm not sure if it's obvious. I can't tilt this very much because it's wet palette, but you can see, I think that this is just a little more viscous. And that's what you get by using brush on sealer or matte medium or something like that is, um, and this is a more watery mix because I added water. But in terms of uh, how transparent the paint is, the effect should be pretty similar. I wasn't super scientific about um, how much I was adding, so it may not be the same from that point of view. But the end result isn't going to look wildly different. This this looks uh, there's a bit of a difference that you can see if you really look, especially when it's wet. Um, but it's hard to explain. You get a little more of the texture where this really flattens out more because it's thinner. I think is what the difference is. There may be a slight sheen depending on which medium you use as well. So I'm using a medium that has matting agent added to it so that I'm not adding any gloss to my paints. If you get satin or gloss medium, you're gonna change the sheen as well as um, reducing the amount of pigment. So because this is already fairly dark, I don't think I need to thin these down too much. I might actually use the one with the, we'll just mix them together actually. There we go, Beth Bo's World. but I'll probably put that off to the side and see if that helps the camera focus. So my goal here is to add this in places where the shadows are, where I don't want it to look shiny and where I want it to look darker. And I'm using the layering technique. So if you're familiar with the uh, Learn to Paint kits, this is the technique in uh, the second Learn to Paint kit. And I am seeing a bit of an edge. So I think I'm actually gonna add I can fix the edge the way I just did. So what I did was, um, let's see if I can make it somewhere more obvious. Maybe right here. So there's an edge there where the, there's like a line. So all I did was wipe, you know, rinse out my brush and rub it along that line to kind of dull it down to soften the edge. Um, but the other solution to that, so I don't have to do that every time I add paint, is just to add more dilution to this and make this more transparent. If you watch Anne's show, she's probably talked about this a bunch. I think she actually tends to thin her paints more than I do. I used to thin my paints a lot more. I tend to use a lot of steps and um, she uses fewer steps and then thins the paint more. So there are a lot of different ways to, to get to something. It, it's, not, it's not always, the, there's not one perfect thing that you're trying to figure out how to do. You're trying to figure out the thing that kind of works for you. And I don't know if this is very much apparent on camera. So I'm actually, if I, if this were um, a matte material, I wouldn't make super deep shadows in here, but I actually want to add a little shadow in this crevice because it, you know, you think about it, the light still be getting in there, even though it's a depression, the light is definitely not getting there. It's not getting in that crevice, but I want it to be less shiny because we're we're doing two things with these shadows instead of instead of just working with making something darker so it looks like there's not as much sun we're also controlling where things look shinier and where they look less shiny so some of the shadows i'm adding particularly since this this isn't a super dark color compared to the original purple And then, of course, with, with layering, you have to, it's dry, it's wet on dry paint. So before I can go add another layer, I have to be confident that the ones that I already put on are dry. And I can tell that they are not. But I 
I'm going to check. Yeah, we need a little bit of shadow here. This, do, this cleaning up the edge thing is actually easier on the metallic surface because the paints are, like the, the surface is slicker. So it's really easy to clean up those edges compared to doing that method with um, matte paint, which I think is, so some people call that feathering. It's kind of like two brush blending. We made up all this language. Um, so if you get confused, do not feel bad about getting confused because the terminology is kind of all over the place. <laughs> but uh, so typically what people do with two brush blending is you apply the paint with one brush and then you have another clean brush, which maybe you've done with water, maybe you've done with spit, and then you pull out that edge and, and feather it so that there's like a smooth transition from the darker to the lighter. You can do it with one brush as well, which is what the way I've been doing it, where you painted the line and then you rinsed out the brush and then you feathered out the edge. All right, I am regretting putting this dark color on. Now, I guess the nice thing is most of the the darkness is more apparent in the um, areas that are going to be shadow anyway. But I should have tried to mix the color closer to the orange of his shirt. Well, salmon, peachy, I guess it's more of a salmon. I like salmon. It's harder for me to mix than most colors. Though. Oh, and that's true. I didn't tell you what the color I put under here was. So I took this salmon, which I like a lot, and I probably should have just put flat coats of this on, the red neon glow. But I mixed it with some red brick to make um, a darker color. As I said this at the beginning, and I'm guessing that some people have joined just since then, uh, common advice for metallics is to apply them over a dark uh base coat of matte paint. So you'd use black or dark blue like um, blue liner for steel metallics and then um, I don't know, walnut for intense brown or some, uh, it doesn't have to be like a super dark brown, but a dark brown for gold or brass or those kinds of colors. And you can customize it further than that. I think uh, Michael Proctor uses a greeny, like a khaki green type thing under gold metallics. Um, I would like to, in a future show, do a test of that. So I will start with different, I'll probably use those plastic spoons that I showed on the swatching show, uh, and start with different uh, foundation coats on them. And then we'll test and see if it makes a difference or not. I think eventually you can get opaque with anything if you paint enough coats. It's um, just how willing are you to do that. And the, the lighter color seems like it probably would have been quicker to get there on this guy. So the other nice thing about me telling you this is, uh, and I like to say this, the people you think of as good painters, which admittedly, I don't know if I'm one of the people you think of as a good painter, but the people you think that have more experience and that are you know amazing painters and stuff, they don't just know everything. They make mistakes too. They have to try some stuff out. Um, and this is a case of I made a wrong guess. I thought going a little darker would probably work better with the metallics, but with these lighter ones, it seems like it didn't. Or just whatever the pigment is that's making these salmon colors. I'd have got there faster if I just left the plain bones. So I suspect that these shadows are nice and dry on this now, so I'm gonna Sometimes it's a case of building them up. So especially if you're thinning your paint down so you're not seeing the transitions, you're going to have to do more layers to build up the contrast. The other thing I'm doing that may not be obvious is, so I've got my brush and the uh, shadow color 
is there on the end. And then as it moves further up the brush, partly I'm doing this because, um, wow, the camera is really just boogery today. So partly I'm doing this because um, the, the less paint you can get up in this section, you know, next to where the metal ferrule is, the better condition your brushes will stay in. So paint getting pulled up there either because you're just smushing the brush around and mixing stuff or because of capillary action, that's one of the things that ruins brushes. So eventually the paint gets in there and it pushes the hairs apart and then you don't have that nice clean brush head anymore. You have like a splayed thing. Um, and in fact, I'm going to rinse this brush out because I've been talking long enough that paint could start drying in there. But the other effect that I'm, I can do with this and you might have to vary the size of the brush to the size of the area that you're doing. So the paint's just about, you know, right to there. And then if I go in that fold, where that paint went up to, goes up to about where I want the blend to stop. But there's some water in the brush from me dipping it. So the water and the paint are kind of mixing in that section, and that will help me get a softer line too. This is going to be more apparent on uh, highlights. It's, I mean, you can't really get in those shadows another way with the brush. But if I apply highlights like this, I might end up with more of an edge. So I will sometimes move the brush so that I'm getting that midpoint, kind of where I want the, um, where I want the softer edge. It's not a huge thing. It's, some people can use that to greater advantage than others, but it's just your brush orientation can help you sometimes and work against you other times. And that's why you see me moving the miniature instead of my brush. So instead of trying to wiggle my hand all around, I'm moving the miniature so that I'm getting the brush in what I think is the best orientation for whatever task that I'm doing. If I keep my brush hand as steady you know, in the same position as much as possible, it's gonna help me build up uh, muscle memory. So I will get better and better at doing this stroke if I just keep doing that stroke. So there's a bit of a line in this section. It's not the end of the world. I can just try and add a little more of a softer one beside it or come back with the metal color after. But I don't think this is dark enough with the deepest shadows. So I think I'm gonna to have to grab the blue liner. Well, what I am tempted to use, except it's, oh no, I brought nightshade purple. So I'll use nightshade purple. Um, there was a violet liner and then there was like a violet shadow. It got turned into that. Um, but it was one of the things that got canceled. So I'm trying not to use too many canceled paints on stream. So I'm going to use Nightshade Purple, which is, I mean, where's the Kraken? So the Kraken has a much more uh, vivid kind of blue-purple element, and then this is a very dull, almost black-purple. And I will want to not apply this over the whole area where I put the other shadows I just want this to go like in the deepest crevices. And I think I will use my seal the mix again. So that's why I have, so this, this very sad looking blue brush is specifically my mixing brush. I'm not saying I never mix with a good brush because I do. Um, but I try to do this where I'm getting the paint all up in the ferrule I try to do that with a crummy old brush that's worn out so that I'm not adding to the wear and tear on my nice brushes. Because acrylic paint is just the worst of all the kinds of paint. I think it's like the hardest one to get out and it's plastic and then it dries and it's just there forever. That's not entirely true. I have um, revitalized brushes with this stuff. So I've had paint and take brushes that people just you know, they dip the brush in the paint and then they never rinsed it out. And I've been able to get that out. But to get this, to get this material and even a liquid material to go up into the ferrule is tough. 
to get the paint that's over there, under there. So eventually, most brushes just die. It's just the, but then, you know, there's a whole life cycle of it's your good brush and then it's your dry brushing or terrain brush and then it's the mixing brush or you can cut the bristles off and do stipples with it. There's a whole life cycle of brushes. So I think you can see how much difference that putting that darker paint made in that fold really helps add to the three-dimensional look. I'm not sure. There's some wet paint in there, so I'm not going to hit that one yet. And I've got the edges, so I'm just going to clean them up a little with the damp brush. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then if I later decided I did want it to be perfect, I could um, spend as much time as I want. But it's better to kind of at least rough in and see where you are and then spend all that time than, you know, spend spend three hours making this full great. And then I'm like, oh, that, that whole cloak color doesn't even work with what I want to do and I need to repaint everything. So now I'll come in here because that's a deep fold. So just doing that plus the light is already helping um, add a little definition. But we're going to add some highlights to this as well. I want to add another coat of my matte paint down in that fold. And then let's see. Mix those two together. Because that isn't like a super deep area, but I do want to... Let me do that a little more, mix these two together. And just hit a few of these places that I don't want them to look as deep as these really big folds. But I want to add a little bit more dimension. Okay, so that's pretty much the idea there. I'm gonna check on my disco friend and see if I feel like he needs Yet another coat. I think we can live with it. I mean, there are a couple streaky places. I don't know. The, the perfectionist in me really wants to give him another coat, so I think I will. And then we'll do the highlights on the wizard. So hopefully uh, this is making sense to everyone and you're getting some ideas for how you might use more metallic paints. I might throw another coat on him too. So then there's also like insect carapaces and um, lots of things that are shiny in real life that you can think about ways that you could use metallic paints to do them. And I might do that on another stream sometimes. There's certainly some nice reaper insect type monsters that we could look at doing that with. And I don't um, get to paint, paint with metallics very much in my everyday life because most of what I paint, the most important thing about it is a photograph, really. I mean, Reaper and Dark Sword have physical collections and they like having the real miniatures and sometimes they take them to conventions or whatever. But the, the primary job of most of the miniatures I paint is to look nice in a photograph on the web store. And certainly when you're doing this kind of, where you're using the matte paint to shade, you're doing the shaded metallic style, uh, It's you can use that and take photographs of it. Um, but it does add a little bit to the challenge of taking photographs, which is definitely not my favorite part of, of the whole painting miniatures for people process. And I tend to find that if you're painting things where most of the metal elements are fairly small. So it's necklaces and belt buckles and stuff like that. Those are much easier for me to paint to look, you know, clear and well-defined with non-metallic metal. And then to be able to take pictures of them. So I just, I don't paint a lot of like heavy plate male figures. And I mean, maybe I should paint some more, but I just haven't been painting that kind of stuff lately. I've painted warriors, but usually 
I don't know, for whatever reason, Ron has been handing me the guys who have, uh, you know, they have mostly leather armor and then they'll have like a few metal plates or something. So I typically paint non-metallic metal just because as, as much as it may seem torturous to paint non-metallic metal, at a certain point it's less torturous than trying to take pictures of metallic objects. So that's, I mean, that's very disco, I think. So once that dries, we, we can look at doing the shading stage. But now let's try to do some highlighting on this guy. So let's see. So I've got the, where did it go? Ah. So I've got the burnished platinum. I think that that is too big of a jump from that straight to that. So I will mix in just a little bit of the black pearl which is a very nice color on its own and I think that it would paint well. I just wasn't sure, like it's so dark that I don't think you can see it on camera. So I mixed the two together for those for those people who came a little bit later. I mix, made a mix of these two to paint this color that's on his cloak. So what I want, and I'll put another drop of this out. I want to mix this color to be kind of in between these two colors. So that's gonna be my first highlight. I think that's probably pretty good. I know it's all shiny on the camera. It's shiny to me too, actually, which is normally when I do this, like the matte paints look shiny to you because of the cameras, but they don't look shiny to me. Uh, so now I am going to thin this down. So I didn't thin the, the metallics down for the base coat because I wanted the opaque coverage. I want them to not be, I want these layering ones to not be 100% opaque because of those edges. I'm going to use, um, oh, I think I missed something in the chat. Let me scroll back here. I missed some Raiders. Hi, Mike Moans and Raiders. Welcome to uh, Beyond the Kit. So what I'm doing today is uh, showing ways to use metallic paints on objects other than metal. So I'm painting like a silk cloak, silk magic cloak for this wizard, and then a shiny uh, satin disco shirt for this character. And if I have a little bit of time left over at the end, I might do some futuristic shiny material pa panels on this uh, space trooper guy. No, of course, Sar Sergeant is his official name. Uh, so for this figure, I've done a uh, base coat with this metal color, and then I've done shading with a matte, a couple of matte colors. So my goal is to dull down how shiny it is in the crevices as well as make it darker in the crevices. And now I'm gonna be adding some highlighting. So this is my original color. I wanna start with this highlight color and then do a little bit, finish up with that one. Um, but I do wanna thin them down a little uh, because it is layering and it will help you not see the edge transitions as much, even on metallics. But because they're metallics, so when I, when I thin down the shadow colors, I used one or the other. I didn't care. For these, I want to use the brush on sealer or a product called uh, matte medium would be a similar product because, so this is the clear part of paint. So this is the binder in your in your paints so it's not as watery and it's going to be able to hold the little metal flakes in the metallic paints in better suspension so if i mix this with water what's going to happen is the metal flakes are going to sink and i'm going to have to stir that little pool every time i want to get fresh paint if i want it to be fully mixed if i do this it should be able to hold the mix better also for the people that came a bit later I mix my paints up right before I start the stream on a Vortex mixer. So mix your paints, particularly metallics, more than you have seen me mix them here. And these paints were actually surprisingly opaque. So, so that's a little ring off uh, the top of my dropper ball. So I may just test these. I don't always do this test. Uh, Usually with matte paints, I can tell pretty well from the palette, but um, 
I do often do, you saw me do the tests on the shadow. I do often do it for shadow colors. Oh, washes and washes and glazes. So I can see the letters under there a bit. I think that means it's transparent enough for me to use for this purpose. And this color seems definitely transparent enough. So I'm going to give it a shot. No problem, Mike Moans. Thanks for uh, coming and joining us. So this color, because it's the highlight color, I want to apply places where I think the light is shining more. Because by applying lighter colors, I will be creating the appearance of the light shining more. So there I got a little further down than I want it. Because you want to leave some of the, this color showing to be in the middle. So I'm just wiping it away with a damp brush. Because acrylic paints do have their disadvantages. I was talking about how they're kind of, they're kind of mean to brushes, but their big advantage is that it's a very forgiving paint. If you do something wrong, you just let it dry and do it again. I've had things that, that I painted over, you know, the color three or four times because I try something and I'm like, nope, that color doesn't go with the rest of what I have. Try again, try again until I like it. So this part that's pick, picking up there, I definitely want to have a good highlight. Right there. And if I end up wanting to go even brighter, I brought the, um, so if you end up and you have something that's like this, but you don't have something like a light color like this, because a lot of the colored metallics are not very light. I have three or four, but a lot of them are special editions. So there's Sophie Champagne that I'm going to use on the orange disco shirt. And then I had Sparkling Snow, in case I need like a super bright highlight on this, which I probably will. And those, those are all colors that were from like conventions or whatever. Um, but if you don't have colors like that, don't fret, because if you have something like Pearl White, or this is Sophie Silver that was also a special edition color, color, they're basically white metallics. So I could mix these into one of these to make lighter versions to do this layering step. But since part of what I wanted to, to check out today was whether I, I was correct that the burnished platinum that's in the swag box and the black pearl that's in the swag box, you know, if this could work as a highlight for that. And so far, it seems to be the case. Because I thinned that down, I'm gonna go ahead and put on another coat to make sure I build it up. But I'm trying to restrain myself from going too much over area. Like some areas have to be the original color. Or we lose the mid-tone. And weirdly, if you lose the mid-tone, you actually have less contrast. I'm not sure I can explain what that is. Maybe it's because there's nothing for it to contrast to. I don't know. But um, it has been my experience that if you paint over too much of the color that's kind of in the middle, between your shadows and your highlights, you need some of that showing on the figure. Now, you need less of it showing for this kind of material. If, if any of you did Google uh, satin shirts or you could look at silk sheets or something like that, um, you'll see that there's a lot more places where it's dark or it's light and there's less kind of in the middle stuff. And that's one of the aspects that makes something look shiny is having extremes of light and dark and then having sharper transitions between places that are light and places that are dark. So I think that's enough of this middle color. I know I think you can tell that that there's more dimension than when I started. I guess it would have been cool if I'd had like a guy that I could have just left the flat metal color and we could have compared him to him, but I I only had one copy of this guy and I didn't think about that till just now. Um but I think he's starting to look more three-dimensional. And now that I put that highlight on, the effect of having the matte shadows, keeping those shadows, regardless of where I'm moving this around, there are areas, so the light is moving, but the shadow parts, I have said, this is shadow, I don't care what you say, Mr. Light. 
and that's why you use the matte colors um, in the in the shaded metallic style or for, for doing this kind of cloth that's why you're using matte colors in the shadows because it's important that it be darker and that it be less shiny hopefully that makes sense but now I'm gonna go to this lighter color which is the burnished platinum And I'm trying to keep that to a little bit of a smaller area. If I were concerned or smart, I could even switch to a smaller brush to try to make sure that that happens. Yeah, it's doing the focus thing again, isn't it? And I'll try to get background to focus on instead. Nope. I don't know why it's being so blurry. Because I do have to be able to get to the paint. So I don't know if you can see it. There's a little bit of an edge thing in some places there. It's harder to see with the metallic, so I don't always like stress about it too much. But I'll go down to my first highlight stage and just kind of work the edges a little. In fact, I might even just paint over it entirely and then come back with the other color. Hi, Valander. So things seem pretty quiet in chat today. Does, if, do people have questions? Do you just kind of want to talk amongst ourselves about other things while I yammer at you about pretty shiny paints? If you guys see Sadie on Saturday, tell her that I was enjoying her pretty shiny paints. So I think that I will go ahead. I'd probably be happy with him well, you can't ever really have enough contrast. You can think you have enough contrast, but you can't ever really have enough contrast. So I think that I will go ahead and take that um, snow shadow and add a little more. Now, I sparkling snow. Snow shadow is a matte paint, completely different. Uh, I don't know if the holiday box set is still in the store. I probably should have checked that before streaming, but I forgot that I was going to try using the sparkling snow. But if the holiday box set is still in the store, this paint is included in that. But again, if you didn't have this color, you could take the, um, not that one, you could take the pearl white that's available all the time and just mix a little bit of that in and make a lighter highlight. Sorry, my desk is very cramped today, so I'm having some logistical problems. Okay. And now I lost my brush, there we go. So I'm just gonna try, in fact, I will switch to a smaller brush so don't feel bad if you use smaller brushes than... I do think it's worth trying. Um, you know, I've been using this two and I wanna use, I'm gonna use the zero. I do think it's worth trying the larger brushes like cause you'll get a lot of advice from painters to uh, use larger brushes. Practice and try to do it, but if there are certain tasks that you just find easier with a smaller brush, like use a smaller brush, it's, <laughs> it's not, um, it's not a bad thing just because you can't use the exact size brush that the, the painter you most admire uses. Also different brushes are different sizes. Like there's no standardization. The size only has meaning within the brand. So let's see, uh, Big Apple SD77 says, I like the Shining Mithril 9454 for a nice shimmery white. That is a great color. I don't like it like plain, but as a highlight color, it's excellent. 
Astro Jean says the holiday color paint set is still on Reaper's website. Um, and I'll, if, if anyone's interested, let me know and I can roll back and get the swatches from that. I did swatches for that one at the same time I did the ReaperCon colors because this is um, your last chance, at least for a while. They're going to, so they've had those as a holiday paint set for the past several years. And Ron has said that this is the last time they're selling that set for a while. All right, I apologize for the focus things. I am trying, but. I don't know if going in closer would help. I don't think it does. I'll try and keep it down here a little. So I'm trying to keep this pretty small. For one thing, it it is since it's not the the purple anymore, it's almost white. It's gonna kind of bleach out the color if I apply this too widely. But for another thing, this is my top highlight. I just wanted to add a little pop in places. I don't want it to take over or be the main color or anything. So it's just really, it really is little space that sometimes you'll just even use the side of your brush to pull, you know, on a hem or something to get that little extra pop. So it's just like a little bit in the middle of that full, a little bit there, a little bit there, and then on some edges. So when, when we're always yelling at you to, you know, go brighter highlights or whatever, it doesn't mean it takes hours and hours and you've got to put it all over the miniature. Sometimes the the last few steps are actually quite simple. Valander the Red says, Holly Berry, Coal Black, Christmas Wreath, and Ginger Cookie alone make the holiday set worth it. And those are all great colors. And Quindy has confirmed the, or she's shared the link to the holiday paint set on the uh, web store. Otter Mama loves cold black and holly berry, and Nomad Zeke loves cold black and ginger cookie. Uh, and I also, I haven't used holly berry a lot. I do want to, because Valander has been talking it up so much that now I'm very curious. Um, but I, I like cold black a lot. I like ginger cookie a lot. Um, turkey brown's a little bit transparent, but when you're doing shading stuff, that's actually an advantage for certain colors. I feel like there's some other color in there that I'm not thinking of that is super cool. But um, now we've learned that the sparkling blue isn't bad. Here's what it looks like on the palette compared. So this was the color I started with. These were the colors I shaded with. And then I layered up with these three. And this one really just went in a few little spots. So I'm, I'm pretty, I feel fine calling this pretty much done for a cloak. And I think that has like a nice silky look. I don't think it's too showy. I think you can still go adventuring. We'll see, it's his magic cloak. I don't know what kind, but some kind of magic cloak. And I will go over to Stu. How are we time wise? Okay, that's gonna be too bad. Not Stu. For some reason, I thought this guy's name was Disco Stu, but when I looked it up, in fact, I will, for people who weren't here previously, this is uh, Kalanen Dark Mantle. In bones, he's 77635. In metal, he's 3847. This is Horace Action Jackson, uh, which if that's probably to tease Bobby Jackson, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Uh, in bones, he's 80023. In metal, he's 50033. And then I haven't done a lot of work on this guy. He's kind of like, if I have time at the end, maybe I'll work on this guy a little bit. Uh, but he's Novacore Sergeant. In bones, he's 80010, and in metal, he's 50005. I'm not sure if there are too many zeros in the middle. So now the interesting thing for this guy is I have to come up with some shading colors. Because there, there aren't as many, you know, salmon color paints. And I'm just going to switch this around so I, where I have more space. So my, my theory for that was to take this neon red neon glow, which it, it's not exactly the same, but it's kind of a similar color, but then to darken it with red brick. So I'm not going for like a super orangey orange, but when I looked at rust colors and stuff, I just felt like they weren't quite what I wanted. So I'm gonna try this and see what we end up with. I'll be conserv I'll put some red off to the side, but I'll be conservative starting off. I suspect it is a more powerful color than the red neon glow. 
Oh, also for the benefit of people who are later. So I actually have two, I'll switch my screen for a minute. I have two water containers over here uh, and I will often do this. So this one, I even wrote on it so I know what it is. It's my one for metallics. And I have a sponge. I use sponges to blot my um, water off my paintbrush when I rinse. And I wrote M's on there. If, if the sponge is dry, you can write it on with a Sharpie. So this is my metallic sponge. And I do try to, especially if I'm painting something that's a gift or it's a display miniature or something I'm going to be spending, you know, more than 30 minutes or an hour on, I try to do the two water thing so that I'm not getting those little sparkly particles in areas of the figure that I don't want to look shiny. And right now I'm working on a part that's matte, so I would not want it to look shiny. Let's mix this up and see what we get. It's like, what is dark salmon is kind of a question. That's a little too dark. I'll just mix a bit more right here. And you've probably had this happen with colors. You mix something where you think you're going to get kind of halfway between, and you don't. And you're like, how come I have to add so much of this color to just a little bit of that color? And different pigments have different, they call it tinting strength. So if you look at the blue, like if you have clear blue, um, <laughs> HM Road Dog says, when you say dark salmon, I think of a goth fish. That is hilarious. Um, uh, maybe it is dark. So um, if you have clear phthalo blue or even just clear regular blue, because that's got a lot of phthalo pigment in it. In fact, I think it is phthalo. It's just a different phthalo. And you mix it with yellow. You, one to one drop is not going to get you green. It's going to get you a blue that's like very slightly teal or something. Because phthalo, even though it's a clear, like it's a very transparent pigment, is a potent uh, potent in mixing strength so it has a high tinting strength and it will just take over a mix I'm gonna try the dark one and see what happens so now this guy's outfit is you know this had the nice big sweepy folds one of the reasons I picked this and partly I just wanted to paint a disco shirt uh, but the other reason I picked it is the the type of cloth that's being depicted here is different we're going to see, does this work as well in little tiny folds as it worked on that wizard? And that is partly why I switched to a smaller brush. All right, let's try the thing that we hope the camera gets less distracted by. So I want you guys to be able to see my palette, but it just doesn't seem to be working out today. I'm not sure if it's because... Um, it is a shiny paint, so if that's like confusing the camera or because I'm using Bones figures that are mostly white and typically when I've shown you figures before they haven't been, I don't know. Maybe one day I'll figure out how to set up a pallet cam. Although then I might run out of real estate. But really there's nothing, I mean, I, I did the mix. It's just the colors that I mixed with a little bit of the... Um, Brush on sealer added because I feel like the more viscous mix is working better to apply over the metallics. Normally I don't care whether I use water or um, brush on sealer unless I'm really thinning something down. Let's see, Melander says, the only set of colors I like better than the holidays are pretty much the entire RVE set. Add in a basic white and you could paint an entire line of figures with just those colors. I need to, I've been playing with them, but I need to play with them a little bit more. So this is the tricky part about using colored metallics, I guess, is that you start having that same challenge you have with other colored things of picking shade and highlight colors that work together. So when you're dealing with steel and gold, you probably kind of get into a routine of, oh, I know that if I use this color for my wash or shadows or whatever, 
it matches. I mean, you know, you can even just use black with steel. I like to use something that is a little bit blue with steel usually, but I like a blue steel look. Um, but now that I'm, you know, painting shiny salmon, that required a little bit of creativity and potential failure in choosing the shadow colors. So for the where the areas where the cuff meets the sleeve and where the collar overhangs the shirt, those are areas I'm probably going to come back and line with a more with a darker and uh, more opaque paint to set them apart because they it doesn't look natural. Something like that would have a shadow line under it. So it looks more natural to add lining. And it often does look more natural to add lining. I know a lot of people feel dark lining or black lining is unnatural and cartoony. But if you look at things, you know, look at a vase or coffee pot or whatever that you have sitting on the table, you'll see a little black line underneath it where it meets the table. And if you were to draw a picture of that and you didn't include the line, it looks like your coffee pot or your vase or whatever is floating. It doesn't look real and connected to the table and like it's part of the real world. So shadow lines and areas of shadow are very realistic. And so is contrast. It's just, you're so used to seeing it that you don't always realize it, I guess. I'm not sure I'm explaining that well. I'm sure it will come up again and I will have another day to try to have better words. But I'm mentioning this because I know some of you, or at least I hope some of you, are planning to come see us at RiverCon and that you might be working on entries for the contest. And lining is a consistent thing that comes up in the feedback after the show. So I thought I would mention it now because why not solve that problem now before you even get there and then you can get different feedback and work on other things to improve. So I think we definitely need a darker shadow. I almost feel like it needs to just be more of the red too. So let's just mix in more of the red. It doesn't look transparent. Get just like half a drop or something. Sidney says, I've been trying to see shadows in regular world items. Like I was looking at a pretty pink flower and I had to stop myself to see where the deep burgundy or black was and it was there, just very small. Yeah. So often, I think what sometimes happens is when you're looking at miniatures painted by people who are really good painters, it's, they've done it well enough that it doesn't look stark or garish to you because it does look natural. And I think the other thing that you may not be thinking about when you look at, particularly if you're looking at photos of, of miniatures like on the web store or on um, sites like Putty and Paint or just the, if you follow the Instagram or Facebook of, of artists that you really like, they're taking those pictures in flat lighting, unless they're cheating. They're taking those pictures in flat lighting. And by that, I mean, you try to set up the lights so they don't cast any shadows. So that the only thing people are seeing in the photographs are shadows that you put there. And that's the level you have to paint to. So when we talk about putting more contrast in, it's you have to add shadows that the light would add. Green users just mentioned this. Miniatures are not totally 3D because they're so small so reality needs a bit of illusion. And part of that is because our light sources aren't in scale. So if you look at a miniature under a desk lamp, well, if I put it up under my desk lamp, you can't see it, but um, you're going to see more shadows than you would see just looking at it under a ceiling light. The desk lamp is kind of more in scale to the miniature. We add the paint because you can't carry a light around over your miniature all the time. So you're trying to add paint to create those shadows and, and highlights too, but the shadows are most important. I think really the shadows are what's gonna make it look more three-dimensional. Um, so that regardless of what the lighting is, 
the miniature still looks correct. It looks like it's got that little desk lamp with it. So when, I mean, I don't know that I've managed to get my lighting set up to be 100% perfect. If you look at some of my photos, you'll see a small shadows on the ground and stuff like that. But that's kind of, everything you see is painted in on, on high level miniatures. And the only reason your stuff maybe doesn't look right to you is because you're still practicing. So it doesn't look right to you for two reasons. First of all, your brain gets used to seeing what it gets used to seeing. So it's used to seeing you paint the way you always paint. So when you try something new, your brain is going to scream at you that it looks wrong because you're not doing it the way you always do it. Um, so there's that little piece of resistance. But... Um, Sorry, I got distracted by the shadows and I don't, now I'm not 100% sure what I'm saying. But that's, so that's one of the problems in pushing yourself to do something new. But then the other one is, it's something new. You're not good at it yet. It's not going to look like the, the miniatures of the people you admire most because you're not looking at the miniature of the first time they tried doing whatever that is. You're looking at the 100th or 50th or whatever time that they've done that thing. So it's not... If you don't like it when you paint a miniature with a lot of contrast, it doesn't mean that a lot of contrast is necessarily wrong. It just means you don't like how you painted it. And it's something new that you have to get used to. You're used to seeing their miniatures look contrasted. You're not used to seeing your miniatures look contrasted. So Valander says, I've found that if I use a strongly contrasting color as the shadow in a zenithal based coat, like purple shadows for red, I actually have to tilt the model and view it from beneath to realize, yeah, that's purple, not dark red. Yes, and um, I will often use, you can use green, purple, blue in the shadows of red. And a lot of the time, if you thin it down a little, it'll look right and you won't really see it until you move it around. And that's, if you come to ReaperCon, um, you'll be able to go around to the, some of the artists who are gonna have desks and we'll have pieces out on the desk. Now ask before you do this. You have to ask before you touch anyone's miniature anywhere at any convention or anywhere else. But ask if you can look at some of them upside down and you, cause you're looking at your thing from every direction because that's another thing that'll happen. You're looking from your piece in every direction uh, and you'll look at it like this and you go like, oh my God, it's the contrast, that can't be right. That can't possibly be right. And you'll dull it back down. So you'll have done it and then you'll pull back because you've turned it from another, but it, it's supposed to look good from this angle. So it doesn't matter if it doesn't look right from this angle, if it looks right from this angle. So you have to get used to when you're, when you're in painting mode, you're moving it all over. When you're in set in assessing mode, you have to look at it from the direction that a viewer is going to look at it. Um, and if you can see, if you can ask some of the painters, if you can turn their stuff around and you'll probably find colors in there, you'll find that things are a lot darker than you think. Um, Things do not look the same when you look at them from another angle. Really, if you have any background in 2D art at all, just pretend the miniature is a piece of paper or canvas and paint like that. Like just try one or two like that. And I bet you'll be surprised to find that it gets closer to looking like how the ones you admire look. So this one's a little more fiddly because it is a lot of um, small things that was able to go quicker with the, the wizard that had just like a few places where I was putting the shadows. So I think it's working. I don't know if it's working like quite as awesome as the wizard did, but I think it's working. I might have to spend some more time thinking about whether this was like maybe going a little more purple in the shadow would have been the right answer for this. Purple in the shadow almost always works. Um, I have a lot of trouble. Sometimes I'll try to paint a miniature where I don't use purple. And, and it's tough because I may not use purple in the main color scheme where you see it, but I use purple in the shadows a lot. It's like my secret weapon. All right, I'm not sure that this is thin enough. This is a very dark shadow comparative to his, well, not very dark, but <coughs> it's somewhat dark and a different 
hues, so it is different comparative to his salmon outfit. I'm going to be sparing with this. When I first thought about doing this, my original thought was to try to get, like, you know, noble woman, princess type characters. But I didn't actually find any that I had that I wanted to paint. And then I saw this guy and I'm like, oh, yeah, disco. That, that works for shiny, too. But now we have to work on some highlights. So this is my starting point. And I have this Sophie Champagne. If I didn't have the Sophie Champagne, I'd probably just use the Pro White. But since this has a little bit of yellow in it, and I've never really used this for anything. I want to try this. And this is fairly new. So some, some of you may have gotten this in whatever promotional way it was to get that. But as with the um, colors from the Wizards thing, I'm going to go up in a few steps. The Wizards robe was darker, so I may not have to go up in as many steps, but we'll see what happens. Well, I guess I'll show you the mixing before I move it again for the purposes of focus. So that's the starting color. Put the middle one there. And I know I want to use this color as a highlight. So I'll just try to mix something in between. I think it needs a little more of that light color. Well, it's interesting looking at it in the, in the monitor instead of in person. Sometimes it, it seems different. Because that is pretty pale, that champagne. And I'm going to add, since these are highlights and I don't want to have like super sharp edges, I'm going to add some of that brush on sealer. And just to reiterate this for the people who might not have been here before, because this is a very helpful tip. I didn't think about this a lot um, a few years back. Somebody mentioned this on Facebook, and I found it very helpful. If you mix metallic paints with just water, the metal flakes are heavier, and they're going to sink down into your pool of paint. Um, if you mix this stuff in, this is the binder of paint. And the metallic flakes are still a little heavier than this. That's why you have to shake your metal paints really well before you use them. But they're, it's going to stay in suspension better with this. And you won't have to stir it. Like if you mix a, a pretty thin mix of metallics with water, you're going to have to stir it like every time you want a fresh brush full of paint. With this, it's going to take, you know, probably an hour or so before it falls out of suspension. So let's see, Avrilina, Avrilina of Darnassus says, I do a lot of stippling art. My background is in drawing before painting. Michael Proctor's style is very attractive to me in translating from drawing to painting. Um, I like doing some uh, texture stuff with stippling, but the other stuff I find, the other thing I find stippling really useful for is when I have those, like in flat paint, when I have transition lines, I stipple along the edges to blur the line a lot of the times. So that's not how I started out doing my smooth blending, but I've kind of evolved into that and I think it's a little quicker than the methods I used to use. So I'll use slightly thicker paint um, and then use stippling instead of using super thin paint and taking forever. It also lets me go back and forth and be very persnickety if I want. Because I no means, by no means mean to imply that it is easy to do the stippling. It does require brush control and patience. But um, Trash Rama says, wouldn't adding more binder mess with the ratio of binder to metallic pigment and reduce the overall metallic effect? It's going to reduce the shininess a little, but it's already going over something shiny. So uh, it, I'm just trying to shift the color of the shiny. So I don't think it will affect that at all. Um, if I was really concerned about it, I could use gloss sealer or a gloss um, medium instead. But 
uh, because I may be reducing the shine slightly because of, I'm not reducing the shine because of the binder. I might be reducing the shine a little because there is some um, matting agent in the um, brush on sealer. Gloss sealer would work in a similar way. So I probably should have done that. I didn't even think about it. Um, it's still the binder part of paint and would keep things in suspension. Um, Valander says, brush pen control from drawing or painting very much carries over to minis. You're starting minis with a head start over lots of people. Yes, the color knowledge also transfers over. And if you get that idea that green users mentioned where they don't look fully 3D and you go ahead and do a lot of the things that you would do in a drawing, that also gives you a head start. Plus stuff like we call non-metallic metal, you just call drawing <laughs> or painting because most there are there are certainly traditional artists who use um you know shiny pigments you can go out and buy golden and liquitex paints that have metallic flake in them they aren't generally as fine as ours like they're a thicker goopier paint and you might see the flake a little more but there are certainly traditional artists who use shiny effects in their work but most people start with the idea that you can render any surface. It's just where you put light and dark. And really that is the same thing on miniatures. When you're making textures and whatever, it's where you put light and dark. I do not know why the camera hates me so much today. I don't know if Trash was here previously, so I will show. So this is the... Um, wizard that I did earlier and I went up to sparkling snow so the top highlights are this color and then there was some of this color and I think they still look pretty shiny even though I did use the, the matte medium so I was trying to I, I thought it was you actually trash who a few weeks ago said ask the question of what can you do with metallic paints other than paint metal objects and that's partly why I'm doing this is because my answer was cloth, but I hadn't actually done it in a long time. So I thought, well, why don't I go ahead and put my money where my mouth is and actually do it and see if it works like I think it does. So I'm specifically focusing on some of the colors that are in the swag boxes for upcoming ReaperCon. Now this isn't, this is some other colors. This was um, Forge Glow. No, I was gonna use Forge Glow, but I love this Afterburn from RV so much that I, I ended up going there instead. But Forge Glow, you could certainly, uh, just say it would just be a little more of a gold than a salmon. Because I can understand why you might not be excited about buying paint colors that you aren't sure how you would use. And then this guy, which I don't know if I'll have time to. So something like futuristic material panels is another option. Um, bug carapaces and other bits of monsters that could also be, you know, shiny or opalescent or whatever. So I haven't done any like shading or highlighting or whatever. This is just the base coat. But this is the Wraith Steel that's also in... I want to say the hobby box, but I'll show the swatch. swatches and begin in a minute. Um, just to demonstrate that there are, there are other things you can do it with, but I think that using the, the shaded metallic style technique where you go matte in the shadows and then use um, metallic colors in the midtones and for the highlights is gonna help with those applications just as it would with metal. Because then you're controlling, you're, you're forcing the light to not shine in some places. So I, I can't control exactly where, well, we'll go back to the fully painted one. I can't control where all the highlights are. Like if I move it around, it's still gonna look shinier in some places, which is, which is what gives it the sheen. But I did pick a few places where I'm saying, okay, these parts should look shiny almost regardless of where it is and then the matte is keeping it from doing the reflective stuff 
uh, in areas that I have said should be shadows. I didn't, so the front I want to keep matte, I think, because when I'm looking at the front of the figure, I think having a lot of shininess down there beside his knees, which is not the most interesting part of this guy, is going to be distracting. So I decided in my mind that his coat was lined with uh, matte fabric and it was just a shiny fabric on the back. You know, in an imaginary world where I finish painting this guy. But I guess it'll be something to do for streams where I don't have a plan. So next week, uh, I think, and I meant to pull it down, I think I'm going to do the like critique and repaint on that bugbear from ages ago. So I did the blacksmith a while ago, and I had thought I might be able to do the blacksmith and the bugbear in one show, and that turned out not to be the case. But I suspect that that is what I'm going to do next week. I'm going to have like a super busy weekend. Um, so I think since I already have like all the critique and stuff uh, written up for that, that that is a good thing to do for next week's show. And then I do want to do kind of, so those are sort of beginner, if you just grab stuff off your game table and you wanted to enter it at ReaperCon or um, bronze level, I'm not sure how you want to put it, level figures. And I do want to try to do one that would be more of a, if I was commenting, you know, getting critique on a more of a silver level figure and trying to respond to that critique. So I'm looking at a couple of things in my um, display case to see whether they might work for doing that critique and repaint thing on. If you didn't see that show, it's up on Reaper, but also if you go to my website, I did a blog post where I outlined the critique and then uh, I saw so there's before and after pictures because that's the one thing I can't really do on stream is once I start painting, you can't see what it looked like before I started painting. Um, but I took before pictures of the blacksmith and I have the reference photos that I used. And then, but if you just want to watch the video, you can also get the link to the video from that. Page on my website. So I'm not sure if that transition was a little stark, but um, I think overall it works. I think it's got a nice disco look. I don't know if I'd go I'm debating whether it's worth going up all the way to white, but I'm kind of inclined against it. Let me see here. I think I missed a comment. Avrilina says, thank you for this lesson. I want to get good at NMM because a lot of painters seem to see that as the ultimate painting challenge over metallics. However, I want to know how to use all the metallics that are coming out more effectively. NMM is tiring sometimes. Yes, it is. It's very tedious. <laughs> I don't always love painting it. Uh, sometimes I don't mind, but sometimes uh, it's just ugh. Uh, and it really, it depends on the context. If you are doing metallics like this, where you've put that same kind of effort in and you've done shading and you've done highlighting and you're paying attention to where your light is in a, in a judged competition, that is not going to be considered a lesser technique or a lesser entry. Um, Michael Proctor, who has, he's, he's actually, he kind of had non-metallic metal as his personal challenge the past couple of years. So a lot of things he's done lately have been non-metallic metal. But prior to that, he was the king of uh, this style of painting, of shaded metallics. He has won many uh, best in show at ReaperCon, and I have only won one runner-up best in show at ReaperCon. So metallics don't mean you're not, like they're not a, a, a lower technique. Now I will say, if you're talking about a contest that is popular judging, where people are like just people are voting in general a lot of people in the painting community have that attitude that non-metallic metal is the harder technique so that may sway votes in that sense so in, the, in those kinds of contests people are impressed by really good non-metallic metal and they recognize the difficulty of that we're doing this well 
can you tell if I did it well or if just the lights are working well or what? Like you may not know, it may not be as obvious that, that this technique was applied with thought and skill, which more obvious that non-metallic metal was applied with thought and skill. Um, but if for judge contests with experienced painters, very few contests I know look down on non-metallic metal. Like a lot of the European painters that are very high level painters use non-metallic metal um, in the historical community, or use real metallics. In the historical community, a lot of people use real metallics. Um, so it's worth learning as the challenge. And because as you start to get that understanding of light and dark and stuff like that, it's very useful to help you understand how to do it better on other things. But, um, you can you can challenge yourself to paint better metallics as well. Now, if you're talking about non-metallic metal that's done decently well versus I just threw a black wash and maybe did a a, a dry brush of a of a lighter color on my steel, yeah, that doesn't that's not going to look as impressive. But that isn't really the same level of painting. That's not about whether it's shiny or whether it's pseudo shiny. Bryce uh, says, I think shaded metallics is the same because you still have to show the light properly. So both can be challenging. Yes, absolutely. And I think if anything, metallics is more challenging for small items. So necklaces, belt buckles, filigree, little things like that. Those to me are easier to paint in non-metallic metal because the shade, like the blending does, isn't, when you're painting something really small, blending's a lot easier because people can't see the transition so you don't have to work as hard at it like this kind of thing is what's hard to get really smooth transitions on for blending um so you can do those little you know super bright hot spots where the light would be reflecting and you can make something super dark where you want the shadow to be to fill to p pick out all the detail of that carved filigree or, or like a necklace that has a sigil on it or something we're doing it with metallics seems to be more challenging because the light's fighting you to a degree and they're a little thicker of a paint I think is probably part of the other reason um but the main reason I paint so much on metallic metal is just because I have to take pictures of things and so Michael Proctor's a photographer that's what he studied and well he's not a photographer by job but that's what he studied in university that's what his degree is in so it probably wasn't as challenging for him to do all his nice shaded metallics and then take pictures of them as it is for me so sometimes I would rather just paint on metallic metal so I don't have to fight with the camera that's not me thinking that metallics is a lesser technique I actually I had a little more fun doing this I think today than I've had painting not metallic metal the past year or so one of my patience level has just not been where it used to be um but yeah so there there is this funny thing with contests where there is a bit of a difference between popular opinion and um what seasoned judges would do like freehand is always very impressive to people as well judges know sometimes you're applying freehand to cover up problems that you uh had in prep or sometimes freehand is even considered distracting. If you're doing freehand and that makes me not look at the face of the figure, that's maybe a bad thing from a judge's point of view where someone in a popular vote contest might be just like, oh, that freehand looks so amazing. I, of course, I like this better than this, this simpler piece that has a lot of more subtle techniques or more artistic decisions in it. Anyway, that's a sidetrack thing. We were talking about shaded metallics. So here are my two finished guys. And in case anyone missed it, this is Kalein in Dark Mantle. So this is the Bones one, but he also comes in metal. So Bones is 77635 and metal is 3847. And this is Horace Action Jackson, who also is in Bones or metal. And in Bones, he's 80023. And in metal, he's 50033. And then I have the Nova Corps Sergeant that I didn't really paint a lot on, but I got a few minutes, so maybe I'll mess around with him. And he is 80010 in bones or 50005 in metal. And I didn't really even set out to make sure that all of the miniatures I picked were available in both mediums. That was just a happy coincidence. All right, so I originally thought that maybe I could do the Dark Reach Shadows on him, but this... Um, this race steel is pretty dark, actually. So 
in terms of value, I those the, the shadow color almost might look the same or be lighter. So I don't think that's enough. I think I have to go to blue liner. Although before I do that, I will just show the paint swatches one more time. So I've been trying to focus on colors that will that are in the um, swag boxes for ReaperCon that's upcoming. So you could go pre-order these colors right now and then receive them in August or whenever they send them out. So I didn't end up using the Forge Glow because I, I was seduced by Afterburn from RV. But the Wraith Steel is what's on this guy. It hasn't been adjusted at all. And that's in the Hobby Box. And then the Swag Box has both of the colors that I used on the Wizard. So I mixed... The base coat was a mix of these two colors just because I didn't, I love this color, but I didn't think it would show up very well on camera. So I wanted to make it a little lighter. If I found that colors tend to look a little darker or less easy to distinguish on camera. So sometimes I fiddle with stuff for that reason. Um, and then the highlights were that color and then just a little bit of the sparkling snow that's in the holiday set. I do have swatches of the holiday set, so if anyone wants me to roll back to where I keep those, I could go get them. But unless someone says that, I'll probably just mess around with this guy with some blue line. At least I thought I had my blue liner. Well, actually, I guess what I need to do is tell you what else is uh, coming up. Let's see if I can multitask. It's very unlikely. So, um... Reaper has a number of other programs that you might enjoy from on Monday to Friday starting at 11.30 a.m. And Forrester does Reaper Toolbox, which is a lot of uh, painting tips. And I think she has different figures that she's painting that you can follow through the whole process. And she shares a lot of tips, I'm sure she has on the ones. I haven't been able to watch all of them, but I've certainly heard a lot of tips on the ones I have watched. Um, and she's the person who designed and mixed the majority of the Reaper paints. So Sadie does it now since uh, Anne moved. But prior to that, Anne designed the line and did the mixing of the paint. Then on Mondays is me, Beyond the Kit. It starts at 2 p.m. All of these times are in Reaper time, which is central. Tuesday is the Crow's Nest, uh, and that's Michael Proctor and Jason Weeby, who's one of the Reaper sculptors, interview uh, people from the industry. And you get to all kinds of cool stories or insight into sculpting or painting or all kinds of things. There's been a couple of, Bryce has been on one doing a deep dive on miniatures he's painted. Uh, Derek's done deep dive as well. And... I, th I did one, I guess is the other thing. So Vigos asks, speaking of your swatches, which pen marker do you use to make the line you paint over? Um, you just want something that's waterproof. So Sharpie works for most surfaces. Um, there's a pen called Pit Pen, and I use those sometimes, and they're made with India ink, and they also work. Both of these, you have to give them enough time to dry. So some papers, it's gonna take longer to dry than others. You can test if uh, an ink is um, waterproof by so paint it out on your paper or whatever surface you're going to use it on give it time to dry and then come back with uh, just a damp paintbrush even and paint over it and see if any of the ink lifts, lift, lifts up but um, alcohol ink markers which is what Sharpie is there are other brands as well. I mean, Copic is the fancy one, and Micron is another one. Um, but alcohol isn't reactivated by water. It's only reactivated by alcohol. So they all work as waterproof markers. So let's see. I was up to Wednesday, which is Miniatures Den with the Italian painter Luca. So if you're curious about the Italian style of painting or the European style of painting, although there are some differences between the various countries, you should check that out. And I think it's just like a fun show in general. He has a good time. And that starts at 2 p.m. Thursday is the Crafty Creative with Josh Foreman. Um, and he's not like really from the miniature world exactly, but he certainly has a lot of interests and skills that are very adjacent to what we do. So if you're interested in train and just general creativity 
and craftiness, like how to make and build things, that is a cool show for you to watch. I'm terrible at all of that kind of stuff. I should probably start watching more so that I could try to get better. Let's see. Is it doing the focus thing again? It's really bugging me. Um, and then Thursday night at 6 p.m. is Reaper Live, which is the show where you get to find out what the previews of miniatures that are coming out. You get all your Kickstarter updates. You get ReaperCon updates. You get to hear from the people that make Reaper tick. And then Friday is Reaper Land with John and Dave, who are more of the people who make Reaper tick. But they do a lot of community-oriented type stuff on Fridays, which is very fun. And then Saturday, that's at 3 p.m. Every other Friday, and I think it, it is this Friday, is Reaper Errant. And that's where some of the artists uh, go on a D&D adventure that is hosted by Nightheart Gaming. And there's some cool terrain, and we've like painted up our miniatures and sent them to Frank so he can put them in his world. And there's music. It's very fun. I have a lot of fun. I don't know if it's fun to watch. Like People do seem to watch it, so hopefully it's fun for you guys. But it's fun for me because I get to hang out with my friends. And then the last thing is Saturday is playing Platinum with Sadie. Although the, I think the last week or two she's been kind of tired from uh, the fulfillment, so I think she didn't do it last week, and I don't know if she'll do it this week because I don't know where they are with fulfillment. But... Um, Hopefully, she'll see you guys again soon. So I am going to, uh, I don't just have a color that I feel works as a highlight color for this right steel. So I'm just going to do the thing I said where I would mix pearl white in. Where am I time-wise? So I assume that Quindy will get us a raid if, jo if Justin isn't paying attention, which he probably isn't because I'm sure they're all crazy busy over there right now. Having to organize, um, so that, that pearl white is a little thick. I thought I had rehabilitated all my paints, but I think I have to work on that one. So I am going to add a smidge of water as well as the medium. But I know, I know everyone's like super frustrated about some of the Kickstarter things, but they're trying to do Kickstarter fulfillment and organize ReaperCon at the same time, and that is a big pile of not fun, I'm quite sure. So have a little pity on them. All right, so I will try to put some highlights on this guy for three minutes, and then we will pop over in a raid to, I don't know what Queen is picking. Maybe she'll tell us. Maybe she wants it to be a surprise. I don't know. I lost my guy now. This is another one where I did, I'm painting this in all the wrong order because it's going to be super annoying to try to, if I really wanted to paint him, to try to come back and get the all the stuff that is under these panels. So this one I would probably not paint again. Um, I mean, to finish off. I do kind of, I, I am tempted to finish him off and maybe the wizard. Um, at some point, like on stream or something. But this, it would be hard to paint some of the other stuff without messing up these panels. Plus I didn't even, I didn't put the metal stuff all over him. Otter Mama says, I just hope the fire marshal inspects and they can start fulfillment again tomorrow for selfish reasons. I'm gonna come back with some of the original color my shadow got a little out of hand right there. So hopefully that helps give um, Trashorama and anyone else who is wondering some ideas of how you can use all the super cool metallic colors that Sadie is always making for us. And I guess we'll let Quindy do the braid thing and let you guys get on with your day. And I hope that was fun. It's nice to see all of you again. I don't think I see a raid thing yet. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me again later. There, okay, we're raiding Jarrett's Train mini Minis. So get, show him the Reaper love. 
I think I'm okay to sign off now. So bye-bye, everyone. Have a good day.